An American company has developed a new transportable nuclear reactor. It's called Evinci. It's modular, can be swapped out like a battery and it is supposed to save 55,000 tons of CO2 per year. And I know, micro-nuclear reactors have faced a lot of criticism in the past, but authorities in Canada and the US are already generally convinced by the concept. From Canada alone, the equivalent of about 53 million euros has been invested. Now the first prototype is about to be tested. But is this reactor really worth it? How does it work and when will it hit the market? That's what we are going to talk about today and with that welcome to the German Science Guy. I'm Dr. Jakob Botton and in Germany we say Los geht's. There are many remote places around the world where supplying sufficient energy is often a challenge. This is a problem for various industrial processes, remote communities, data centers and critical infrastructure. The US company Westinghouse claims to have solved this problem. They have developed a microreactor that functions like a swappable battery. The reactor is called Evinci and the company says it can run for at least 8 years at full power, is super flexible, can be easily replaced and is also low risk. At the same at the same time, a single Evinci microreactor is supposed to save up to 55,000 tons of CO2 per year. Now, that's a lot of promises, but how does this concept actually work? As I mentioned, Evinci is a microreactor. And unlike next gen reactors, you can't easily define microreactors by their fuel type or coolant. Instead, microreactors have three main characteristics. Characteristic number one is Microreactors are factory built. This means all parts and components are fully assembled in a factory and only then delivered to the site. This brings us to characteristic number two. Microreactors are transportable. They are generally small and have a relatively small output. For comparison, a small modular reactor has an output of about 20 megawatt electrical, up to about 300 megawatt electrical. Megawatt electrical is a unit you don't hear every day. It's used to measure the electrical power generated by a power plant the power that is actually delivered to consumers. A conventional nuclear power plant has about 1000 megawatt electrical. A microreactor, on the other hand, only has 10 to 20 megawatt electrical. Some sources go up to 50 megawatt electrical. So, of course, this sounds like very little at first in comparison, but it has the advantage of making microreactors much smaller, about 100 to 1000 times smaller than conventional nuclear power plants. This makes them mobile. You can transport them by truck, train or ship. And this allows them to be used in remote locations or places where the energy supply has been disrupted, for example, by natural disasters. And one once the microreactors are on site, characteristic number three comes into play. Microreactors are self regulating. This means they require few to no people to operate the reactor. Additionally, this type of reactor uses passive safety systems, which are designed to prevent overheating and meltdowns. They can also be very easily integrated into microgrids, small segments of the power grid. This could be a single industrial site or a neighborhood, for example. And this allows microreactors to supply these small areas independently from the main grid, creating self-sufficiency and restoring power supply. And they can do this for extended periods, because microreactors can run for years without needing a fuel change. All these features make microreactors extremely interesting. Besides post-disaster reconstruction or powering remote villages, they can be used for other things too. For example, isolated industrial sites like mines or data centers. I've also seen proposals to use them for producing hydrogen or synthetic fuels. And it should also be said, of course, there are also military applications as well. And now there has been a real milestone in this technology. The US company Westinghouse has become the first reactor developer to complete the Front End Engineering and Experiment Design Phase or FEED for short. This is according to press releases from the company and the official US Office of Nuclear Energy. Oh, and talking about press release and sources, by the way, in every video on my channel, I'm always 100% transparent with my sources. This is part of the concept of the channel because I said I want to make the videos like I write my papers for university by giving sources for everything I say, so you find the sources always here down in the corner. So, the FEED process involves the detailed elaboration of several points. These include a schedule, budget, design, a test plan for the experiment and a detailed preliminary safety report. And that report is the basis for all further steps. 
Specifically, this is about the Evinci microreactor. It is designed to have an output of 5 MW electrical and run uninterrupted for at least 8 years. Westinghouse also promises the microreactor can be connected to the existing power grid seamlessly, quickly and flexible. It can be installed above ground and requires no water to operate, not even for cooling. According to the company, setting up such a facility should take less than 30 days and save up to 55,000 tons of CO2 per year, although we'll have to come back to that point later in the video. But indeed, both Canadian and US authorities are convinced by the concept. For example, almost 53 million euros are coming from Canada to implement a Vinci reactor in the province of Saskatchewan. But are these promises realistic and how does the reactor actually work? An Vinci reactor plant has three central components, a reactor core with fuel, heat pipes and a power conversion unit. Let's break it down. So Westinghouse uses so-called trisoparticles as fuel. Triso stands for Tree Structural Isotropic Particle. This is a specialized nuclear fuel made of coated uranium oxide particles. The fuel has layers of pyrolytic, graphite and silicon or zirconium carbide. The structure makes triso fuel particularly resistant to material damage. Overall, it's considered very safe. In the reactor core, controlled nuclear fission takes place as usual. This generates heat of about 600 degrees Celsius, which needs to be dissipated. And for that, the reactor has a pretty smart system. It uses heat pipes, which can transport heat extremely efficiently and most importantly, passively. This works in a so-called Brayton cycle optimized for the reactor. The heat pipes in microreactors are filled with a sodium solution. The heat from the nuclear fission causes the solution in the heat pipe to evaporate. The vapor then flows through the temperature and pressure gradient to the power conversion unit. So this is kind of a turbine where the gas expands and drives the turbine, allowing the reactor to produce electricity. After this expansion, the gas cools down, condenses and flows back into the reactor. A so-called wick system then absorbs the liquid and using capillary forces guides it back to the evaporator and the cycle starts all over again. The advantage? This phase transition transports the heat energy, that is the change from liquid to gaseous state. This is extremely space efficient compared to simply heating a coolant. And heat pipes have another advantage. Due to their passive operation, they don't need an additional pumping system. Both factors make this type of cooling particularly interesting for small reactors as they allow for a greatly simplified design with few components. And you can see that in the space requirement. A complete Evinci plant needs less than one hectare of land, according to Westinghouse. That's about half a soccer field. Compared to conventional reactors, that's really, really small. Now there was a big breakthrough where Westinghouse completed the FEED process. That means Evinci can be tested in practice as early as 2026. This will happen at the newly built DOME test site. DOME stands for Demonstration of Microreactor Experiments and is the first facility ever built to test microreactors. Westinghouse aims to have the first reactors operational by 2030. But is this really a good idea? Let's take a look at that in the big but or the big hurdle of the video, also an element of every of my videos where we look at the limitations of an innovation or technology. But first, quickly hit subscribe and activate the bell so you don't miss any more videos. So, in the big hurdle, we need to take a closer look at the promises and the fuel. Triso fuel has a really low uranium density and that shortens its operational lifetime. Westinghouse states that it is 8 years. And that sounds like a lot at first, but if you look at the lifetimes of other microreactor projects, you will see they can sometimes last 15 to 25 years. In fact, there's another fuel that is very popular called Helu. It lasts way longer. Furthermore, the low uranium density is also bad for the price of electricity, which could end up being quite high. Projections suggest that a megawatt hour of electricity from microreactors would cost between 140 and 410 US dollars, which is between 128 and 376 euros. Just for comparison, the electricity price from large scale solar plants with storage in Germany is currently around 60 to 108 euros per megawatt hour. So, big difference. The safety of the fuel must also be questioned. While we are getting better at producing triso fuel every year, especially with improvements in temperature resistance, we still haven't fully understood how the fission product release mechanism in triso fuels work. This means at very high temperatures, the fuel could release fission products despite its high safety rating. And then there's a problem with disposal. Nuclear waste is already problematic. With triso fuels, the problem gets even bigger because of the graphite, the waste volume is about 10 times higher than with conventional fuels. So you can imagine if we have to store more, we also need more storage space. And then there's the point about CO2 that we need to talk about. 
It's hard to trace where Westinghouse gets this high CO2 savings figure from. However, it seems the company is referring to remote communities in Canada and Alaska. They often rely heavily on diesel fuel for power generation. The website states, in Canada enough diesel is burned for heat and power generation each year to fill 227 Olympic swimming pools. That's more than 567 million liters. And if Westinghouse has its way, this could be easily saved with an Evinci reactor. But actually, it's likely that this 55,000 ton saving can't be universally applied to all locations. But for provinces like the one in Canada, it is still an exciting solution. Fundamentally, the microreactor sounds very promising. Especially for such niche applications, Evinci is really exciting. And in these cases, the higher electricity price might be bearable. At least Westinghouse says a kilowatt hour of diesel generated electricity in remote areas of Alaska can easily cost one US dollar, which amounts to 1000 US dollars per megawatt hour. Compared to that, even the 410 US dollars from before suddenly seem extremely cheap. And this is where it could really pay off. But what do you guys think about this reactor? Do we need something like this or do we need more flexible alternatives? And if you're for the reactor, which remote corner in your country do you think this needs the most? Write it down in the comments. Over here you can find another video about the Pebble Bat reactor in China. It's also a nuclear reactor way, way bigger. So take a look and see you next time. You're Jacob.